Let's go ahead and turn our Bibles, Revelation chapter 2. We're looking at the church of Thyatira. We're going to try to finish this up this week. And then we'll wait for the other ones until Brother Ralph goes on vacation again. Okay. <laughs> okay. So Revelation chapter 2. We're going to go ahead and uh, we'll follow along as I read verses 18 through 29 real quick just to kind of introduce us to this church and we'll do a re little review over what we studied last week and then we'll uh, start in where we stop. Okay, so verse 18 says, And unto the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. I know thy works and charity, and service, and faith, and thy patience, and thy works, and the last to be more than the first, notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself, calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants, to commit fornication, and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. And I gave her space to repent, for her fornication, and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins and hearts, and will give unto every one of you according to your works. But unto you I say, and unto the rest of Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine, and which have not known the depths of Satan, as they speak, speak, I will put upon you none other burden, but that which ye have already, hold fast till I come. And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations, and he shall rule over them, with a rod of iron, as a vessel of a potter, shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my father. And I will give him the morning star, and he, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Let's pray real quick, and then we'll get right into this. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be here today. And Lord, we thank you that Ralph and Patty have made it back safely, and that Pastor Story and his wife are here Lord, I pray that you would just use them today. Uh, encourage those that come. Lord, I pray for those that are on their way. And Lord, I pray that you give them safety. And then Lord, I also pray for those who are traveling right now. We think of Jacoby especially. Lord, I pray that you'd help him and Allison as they uh, get established once again after this long absence. Lord, I pray that you give them a great church to go to. Lord, I pray that you would uh, just knit their hearts together with a with a new church that they're going to be spending time with over the next few months and then uh, i don't know exactly where you'll put them next but lord i pray that you would supply the need they have lord and i pray that you would meet each one of our needs this morning and lord help us to be encouraged we thank you for the uh, visa and lord i pray that you would provide a home for us uh, if it's your will a little bit closer here to the church building and Lord, we thank you for your grace and goodness. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so we started studying this last week, and we went real quickly. We did a, we kind of talked about the, uh, the situation in the city that they were dealing with. Uh, we talked about the fact that this city was, we know from archaeology, it was heavily, uh, they had a lot of trade unions. Of course, we'd already heard about this before because Lydia, okay, was a seller of purple who was met by Paul at Philippi. And uh, she, she was from Thyatira, she was a seller of purple. And we know, even from archeology, span we know that some of the really powerful people were actually in the trade union that belonged to the dyers, okay? They were generals and politicians and, and rulers and all these different things that the chief of police, I mean, we literally have, you know, that just like when we go to Akale and we can see it has those Roman uh, writing, the Latin inscriptions on the tombs and stuff, you can literally see that they were all part of that, the priestess, the high priestess. And so we know that there was a lot of powerful people involved in it. And that's one of the things trade unions 
in the Roman Empire were at first and foremost religious groups, okay? They actually were, they, they were given to a certain deity, okay? And those deities was part of their being part of that trade union was being part of that mystery. And we talked about the fact that one of the most uh, well-known goddesses that they worshiped in Thyatira was, uh, I'm gonna say it wrong, but it's Demeter, okay? Who is the goddess of, um, basically she's the one that they say brings life, okay? And her and her daughter had one of the longest standing mystery cults in the ancient world for over two millennium. A matter of fact, even in, into the modern era in some places in Greece, they changed it into a saint and they still worship her even today. So it's kind of interesting there. So we, the reason I stress that is because that helps you understand what's going to happen here. Then we went on from there and we looked at, we looked at the, the message to the church and we talked about the revelation of Jesus Christ and we talked about the fact that each revelation of Jesus Christ, and we see that in verse 18, unto the angel of the church in Thyatira, write these things, saith the Son of God. We're on big number three. Abigail, we're on big three, if she wants to get it with her notes there. Okay? The message, we had the revelation of Jesus Christ. And uh, the angel, let me read uh, Revelation 2.18. And unto the angel of the church in Thyatira, write these things, saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet like fine brass. And we talked about that. That's a picture of judgment. And these revelations of Jesus Christ... Each one, each one was specifically, God gave those revelations because it had some significance to what was going on in the church. And in this case, he's coming to judge the church, okay? There's no doubt he's letting them know, I'm coming to, I'm coming to judge. And we called this church, I don't know if I've already said this, but we called this church the seduced church, the seduced church. And uh, we, we looked then, from then, we looked down at the last thing we looked at was the commendation of the church. And that was in verse 19, I know thy works and charity and service and faith and thy patience and thy works and the last to be more than the first. And God listed off six things that they were doing that he commends them for. He commends them for their works, their charity, their service, faith, patience, and then it ends with works. And it's interesting how the Bible says that the last was more than the first. In other words, this church was, you know, they were going out and they were doing good deeds, we could say, and they were busy and it's not wrong. Churches ought to be busy. You know, that's what God has created us. We've been studying in Titus, you know, sound doctrine should produce what? Good works. Okay. And so our churches, you know, our churches as Christians, we should be full of good works, but they're a result of following God, not the other way around. And see, a lot of people do good works, but they're doing it for themselves. Okay. There's lots of organizations that do good things. Okay. I mean, praise God, praise God, you know, people do try to do good. Otherwise, the world would be absolutely miserable, okay? So I'm thankful that, you know, not everybody's running around trying to kill everybody, okay? The people do actually try to do good things, but they're doing them for the wrong purpose. A Christian should be doing good works, what? As a result of what Christ has done for them. And so that brings us down to where we stopped, and that's big letter C, uh, the common condemnation of the church. And that starts in Revelation chapter 2, verse 20. And it says, Nevertheless, I have a few things against, against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants, which commit fornication, I mean, I'm sorry, to commit fornication, and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he that searcheth the reins and hearts, and I will give unto every one of you according to your works." Now, I want you to see here, because like I said before, our main focus is to try to look at this, how this applies to churches that exist today, okay? Because these were all contemporary churches. The first thing I want you to see is the seducer of the church. Who was the seducer? And this may be a little bit shocking. Unlike other churches, God singles out a person who, who is causing 
problems in the church. We can make some assumptions about her identification based on the information in verse 20. First, the word that woman specifically implies a wife in Greek. Okay, that word it actually means a wife in Greek. Second, she is called Jezebel. Unlikely her name, but more about her character. Jezebel was the wife of the weak and wicked king Ahab, okay, in the Old Testament. The Bible says that Jezebel stirred up King Ahab to do much wickedness in Israel. And we actually read about her. I'll read it real quick for the sake of time. But 1 Kings chapter 21, 25, and 26, it says, But there was none like unto Ahab, which did sell himself to work wickedness in the sight of the Lord, whom Jezebel, his wife, stirred up. And he did very abominably in following idols, according to all the things as the, did the Amorites, whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. And you know, for this, we can see that the, this, that woman was most likely the wife of a very influential person, a person in the leadership of the church. Finally, it tells us that she claimed to be a prophetess or to speak for God. From all this, I am very confident that this woman could be none other than probably the pastor's wife. And a lot of people, I, I, this based upon the picture that he gives and also the fact that she's claiming to be a prophetess. This also explains why she was allowed to continue in seducing the church. Okay, she was there seducing the church. How was she allowed to continue to do so? This, um, let us, let me re just remind us, no one in the church is above reproof and no one should be allowed this level of control within the church. No one should. Not the pastor, not the pastor's wife, nobody in the church should have this level of control. We have a real problem in many modern churches because powerful people go unchecked. And I'll just say this to my English speakers, just in the last few years, we've had some very high profile cases where we've had pastors and pastor's wives involved in some really just awfully wicked things. And nobody stood up and said, this is wrong. And that's one of the reasons why I believe she may not have been the pastor's wife, but I think there's a pretty high probability she was the pastor's wife. Um, she, at the very least, she was someone in the church that had a lot of power. Um, the second thing I want you to see, so we talk about the seducer, okay? And, and the, the, the key thing we can take away from there is, listen, no one is above the Word of God, okay? And so we need to be willing to stand up, even if it costs us something in the church, if we have someone like that, we need, to put, we need to put a check on them, okay? We cannot allow them to continue their wickedness. Well, let's talk about the seducing of the church. The seducer was seducing the church, according to verse 20, by teaching and seducing my, it says this, teaching and seducing, and it says this in quotes, my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. And I want you to kind of remember what I told you in review, of those of you who were here last week, remember that the city of Thyatira was heavily controlled by trade unions. As a matter of fact, they say, in reading up on this on archaeology, they say that this is the place where they found the most evidence of trade unions in the whole Roman Empire, at least what they've dug up was here in Thyatira. These unions were very much connected to idol worship. Each union would have its own meeting house, where they would gather to conduct business and party. If you want to be connected, you need to be part of these meetings and party, with, and, and party which involve fornication and eating things sacrificed to idols. Okay, A lot of times these meeting houses were actually connected to the temple itself. I mean, literally they were on the temple's premises. And so it was very, very important uh, you know, within the culture and the society to, for you to be part of these. Now, Jezebel was not just using her position to say God would be okay with their sin, okay? After all, they had to make a living, right? You know, that's basically what would be her excuse. You know, you, you live in Thyatira, you gotta, you're going to make die, you got to be part of the guild or, you know, union. 
okay, to make that die. And, and so, you know, God wants you to make a living. And so, you know, you just kind of go along with the crowd. But, you know, that's basically what she was telling them. But not only that, but she was, she, after she took it to a, a step further by leading the charge into sin. In verse 21, she is called fornicator. In verse 22, she's called an adulteress. Okay, so she was not only just, you know, saying it was going to be okay. She was actually involved in this sin. It is hard to imagine the level of wickedness, this level of wickedness within the church. However, it seems that never a year passes, and I've already said this, without a very similar story being aired in modern Christianity. Uh, you know, I just saw a story just the other day. And I'm not going to name the, the organization. It wasn't a Baptist, praise God. But, you know, that they were involved in, in this kind of level of, of wickedness, you know, and covering up this kind of stuff within the power structure of a so-called church. And, you know, I, I don't have to go too far. We don't want to be, because there's plenty of Baptist cases that have come up recently doing the same kind of thing, using their position to do things that were just wicked. The thing that we see here is her husband appears to have done very little to reign in his wife. If it was his wife, he, she, he doesn't seem to have done anything to reign in. Regardless, even if it wasn't his wife, he had done very little, apparently, to try to reign in this woman. Um, and instead, seemed to be the pastor seemed to have been dominated by this woman. Okay? Remember, women are not to take leadership over men in the church. Anytime you see this in the church, get as far away as you can. It will not end well. You cannot violate God's order and not pay the price for disobedience. Yeah. Listen, I mean, you just, God has an order. It's established whether, whether we like it or not in our modern ideas. What's right is right. And you do things right by God's order and things are going to go well. Okay, you do things outside of God's order to try to you know, get along with the world we're living in, and things are not going to go well. Okay, So stay away from it. So we see, first of all, we see, we've looked at the seducer, who she possibly is. We've seen the seducing of the church. She was basically encouraging them to participate in these idolatry, and which included fornication and eating things sacrificed to idols. Now we go on to the seducer being warned. According to verse 21, it says, and I gave her space to repent of her fornication and she repented not. You remember how he, he appeared? He appears with those feet of brass and flame of fire. You know, listen, he's not coming now to warn anymore. The warning's over. And the first God had already given this warning to this woman and she had refused to repent. Once a person goes down the road of lust and power, it seems like they almost will never come back on their own accord. And that's the truth, because it's just like, that's why you don't get into the habit of lying. You know, some people sometimes are like, well, you know, I just don't want to take responsibility, so they lie, right? And then what happens? And they got to cover for that lie, and then they got to cover for that lie, and then they got to cover for that lie. And it goes further and further, and the longer they get away with it, the harder it is for them to come back. Right. Because they're going to pay the price. They're going to pay the price to come back. And they don't want to do that. So, once you are in the middle of sin, you will always find justifications for your actions. And, you know, that's, that's the fact. People, I mean, I just think about some of these people I've heard, you know, I'm talking about big name religious leaders. You know, after they get caught and everything falls apart, some of them sometimes... They come back, okay? Most of them don't, though I hate to say it. A lot of them still got, they still just go on justifying, you know, it's not my fault. And, uh, you know, that doesn't, that doesn't work, okay? Second, God and his love always, I want you to think about this. I want you to think, so first of all, it's always hard to come back when you're caught up in this sin. But second of all, I want you to think about this. God and his love is always long-suffering towards us. Okay, he's always willing to be long-suffering, but I want you to understand there comes a point when God's love and suffering is done. Okay, you know, some people are like, well, God will love me. You know, I can do whatever I want. I can sin. God always, no, according to the Bible, God's love only, I mean, he still loves you, 
but his, his long suffering and withholding justice comes to an end. And when that end comes, he will judge. And this lady, if you see here, she's run out. She's run out of time and there's only judgment left. Number four, we see the seducer's judgment. In Revelation 22 and 23, it says, Behold, I will cast her into a bed and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with death and all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins and hearts and I will give unto every one of you according to your works. I want you to think about this a few things, okay? God does not tolerate sin in the church and he especially punishes those who lead other people into sin. And that's what this woman was doing. She was leading other people. She wasn't just sinning herself. She was leading others into sin. In these verses, God promises that she and those who follow her will be in great affliction. We do not know what God did, but there is no doubt that he did what he promised. Okay, no doubt whatsoever. Not only that, but he promises death to her children. And this could be her literal children or her spiritual children. Whichever it was, God says that all the churches will understand that he, God, has punished her. It tells us it is obvious from this that her ambitions may have gone beyond the city and church at Thyatira. God ends verse 23 by warning us that he knows what is in our hearts and he may look good. We may, I'm sorry, we may look good on the outside. We might have the right words and full of good works for others, but God knows what's really in our hearts and he judges what's really in our hearts. And let me just kind of go back there. And the reason I say why she might have had ambitions beyond that church is because the Bible says specifically that what all the churches are going to hear and they're going to know that I've judged her. And, you know, this is here again. We see this in our world a lot of times. Very powerful people in powerful positions. They become increasingly ambitious. And that ambition goes way beyond just the local church. It goes to influencing even people outside of the local church. And that's one of the reasons I'm talking about within other ch local churches. And that's one of the reasons why we believe in the autonomy of the church. Part of the reason we have autonomous local churches is to try to compartmentalize. I really believe, according to the principles taught in God's word, is it compartmentalizes sin. And what I mean by that is an infection in one church doesn't spread to every other church. And throughout history, throughout the Bible, if you think about this, God has done this again and again. He created nations, okay, to limit sin. At the Tower of Babel, he created separate languages to limit sin. He created government to limit sin. There's all these places that he's limited sin, since, especially since the flood, that he's created all these things. And part of the local, autonomous local church is to limit the spread of these kind of false doctrines. Because if you have them all connected, it infects every one of them. So we, that's part of what's going on here. So the, the seducer's judgment. The second, the last thing I want to look at, I'm sorry. Yes, let's look at the comforting. This is continue on with the message now. So we've talked about the seducer. Now we're going to go on to the comforting of the church. And you know, it's great that God, in all these passages, he always comforts the church. You know, even in the, and it's hard to imagine this. Can you imagine there's seven churches and there can be this much difference in seven churches that are all within the same geographical area. They're not very far apart. They're only a few miles. And by today's standards, there would be a quick commute, okay, between each other. Now, I understand back then there was a little bit longer for them to get between these places, but they're very close to each other. They no doubt had contact with each other because this was a circular letter that traveled between the seven of them. OK, so God, even 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 these churches that had these severe problems, he always comforts them. And the comfort, the message of comfort is in verse 24 and 25. It says, but unto you, I say, and unto the rest in thy retire, as many as have not this doctrine and which have not known the depths of Satan as they speak. I will put upon you none other burden, but that which ye have already Hold fast till I come. He doesn't give a lot of instructions. He says, just hold fast till I come. 
The message of the, to the church in Thyatira begins with a picture of Christ coming in to judge sin in the church. However, after the judgment, there is a de- there is a declaration. I'm sorry. However, after judgment is declared against the ungodly in the church, God in his mercy extends comfort to those who had refused to be seduced. No doubt they had paid the price both personally, politically, commercially, and within the church. They would have been the outcasts, trust me. They were not in the in crowd in the church. They had found themselves part of a church that did not want them. The depths of Satan is a reference to the deception of Satan, but also possibly in reference to being part of the secret rites of the god Demeter. We don't know for sure, but we believe that may be a quote, because they, if you notice how it's worded there, it says, which have not known the depths of Satan as they speak. Okay, so we're not sure, but they had they had given up all of that to follow God. God is a loving father does not add to their already heavy burden, but encourages them to hold fast till he comes. And that's how God is. You know, God is, you know, some people think that Christianity is like this heavy burden, you know, like, you know, okay, God, you know, all the do's and don'ts and, you know, you can't have a, you got to walk around with a big frowny face and always, you know, have a miserable life, can never have any fun. And that is not the truth. That is not the truth. Okay. God does not put a heavy burden on us. And that's what he tells this church. Just hold fast. Till he comes. And the last thing we want to look at is uh, the promise to the churches. Revelation chapter 2 and verses 26 through 29, we see the promise to the churches. He that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. As the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my father. And I will give him the morning star. And he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Many seek power in this present world. They will sell themselves to wickedness to get it. Remember that Satan is the ruler of this world. We're talking about the world system. God sometimes determines to set a godly person in a position of power. There are many examples in the Bible. However, by and large, the Christian is not often put into a position of power in this present world. The woman at Thyatira was willing to give anything for power. God is telling us not to seek after the power in this world, but instead to follow him. He promises that in the next world, as a reward for being faithful servants, we will reign with him. The morning star that he promises is none other than himself. Revelation chapter 22, verse 16 says this, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify unto thee these things in the churches. I am the root and offspring of David and the bright and morning star. The words of Jesus should be a constant reminder to us, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. There's coming a day when our Savior is going to return, and he's going to rule and reign on this earth. And it's going to be a righteous rule. And all these things that we see, all the injustices, all the evil, all the wickedness that are going on in our world, the lying, the cheating, it's all going to be done because he's going to know everyone's heart and he will allow no one to get away with their deception. Don't be seduced by the promises of power in this world. Follow Christ and hold fast till he comes.